Thank you for joining us today. Scripture says that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That word will indicates a choice that I have made the choice to rejoice. No matter what's going on, I've made a decision to rejoice and be glad in it because God is good all the time. It's sometimes difficult to see it in the midst of a storm, but he is good and we declare that with confidence. Listen, we're about to start our worship celebration. Let aside all the distractions, focus in on the words and the music and really allow yourself to find your way and find your peace in him. That our peace is not in circumstances, our peace is in a person and that person is Jesus. You come. 
Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. And with your blood, you, you bought my
are new over and over as surely as a morning comes you're faithful and i sing of your love over and over i'll sing of your love over and over i'll sing with every setting sun Hi, I'm Nisi. I serve as the children's pastor here at Agape Church. We're so excited you've joined us this weekend. We have several ways for you to stay connected to what's going on at Agape Church. We'd love for you to subscribe, like, follow us on all of our social media platforms. Hey Agape, it's that time where we honor God and worship through our giving. Listen, even in these difficult times, God has been faithful to provide for us. And even in the midst of difficult times, we still honor Him by putting Him first, by giving Him the first of our time and giving Him the first of our resources. Listen, when you give, you're not only helping to continue to support the ministry here at Agape, but you're also helping our missionaries in Cambodia and Italy and the other ministries that we support all around the world, as well as opportunities to be a blessing here locally. And so again, I appreciate your generosity. We want to continue to be a generous church as we continue to honor God with first fruits. We do it as an organization as well. We want to continue to tithe as a church so that we honor God and always put Him first. Scripture is very clear, never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. I appreciate your generosity. You all have been amazing. Thank you for continuing that as we continue to fulfill the vision and mission of what God has called us to be as a body and a Agape Church. Thank you so much. So here at Agape, there are three ways to give. One, you could text Agape Next to 77977. You can go online at the agape.church or you can always mail in your gift to Agape Church at PO Box 4242, Laurel, Mississippi 39441. Thank you. We're praying for you. We love you. God bless. Thank you for joining us today. We are in week number two of this message series called Afterlife. The afterlife, commonly referred to as, as, as life after death, is the belief that the essential part of a person's identity continues after the death of their physical body. But for the Christian, afterlife for us is the belief that the essential part of our identity comes alive after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So in this series, we're going to look at some of the encounters that Jesus had on earth in his afterlife that are lessons about how our lives should look like after he gave his life and rose from the dead for us. So today, I want to talk about unresolved guilt. I want to talk about unresolved guilt, and I want to talk about an encounter his last encounter Jesus had with the disciples at the Sea of Galilee. Let's start in John chapter 21, starting at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples 
were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. You see a very interesting statement there. Simon says, I'm going out to fish. And when you look at that it, by itself, it seems almost harmless. But when you look at the meaning of what those words actually said, it wasn't that I'm going out to fish like I have nothing else to do. Those words were actually Peter saying, I quit. I quit. I'm going out to fish. See, what has happened now is Jesus is alive and there is a now a brand new normal. And Peter is not happy about this brand new normal. Jesus has now failed to communicate his travel schedule to the disciples. He hasn't told them where he is or where he's going. They're hearing about him, but, but they're not seeing him. And, and when we, we, we were the original entourage before all these other people, before you blew up in, in, in Jerusalem and, and after your resurrection, we were the ones that was there. You, you left his, he's left his entourage, so to speak. It's, 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 imagine what they are thinking. And finally, you know, they're out and they're waiting because now that he's alive and they've seen him now, this is actually going to be the third time that they've seen him. They know he's alive. There has to be an expectation in them that, man, it's going to be just like it used to be. Remember when we used to travel with him. Remember the miracles. Now that he's risen, man, this thing about to blow up and we're going to be right there. Still thinking that he's going to establish a different kingdom than what he's always intended. Still having expectations that even though it's a new day, he's going to restore the old day. Peter is now whatever day this is after his resurrection, clearly he's upset because he hadn't seen enough of Jesus, but he keeps hearing he's around. Everybody's talking about him, and yet he hadn't come to see his boys, so to speak. So Peter decides, I quit. I've been waiting for my life, for the rest of my life, to waiting for you to get the rest of my life going. And now you don't have time for us, but you got time for everybody else. I quit. I'm going to go back to my old hustle. I'm going to go fishing. And because Peter is gifted with God, a God-given ability to lead, the other disciples with them say, yeah, we're going to go with you. And what we don't understand is that when God gives people gifts, that those gifts don't just turn on and turn off if, if they have a, a, a Christian world mindset. They are very much a leader because God gave them that ability that still needs to be developed. And if it's not developed for the kingdom, how do you know they get developed for, for, for the, for against the kingdom? So now Peter has just said, I quit. I'm going back. I'm going fishing. Scripture goes on to say, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. Wasn't that just typical how Jesus would be just, just when, have you ever been to a point in your faith walk where you just said, I quit. I'm going back to my own life. And that's exactly when Jesus shows up in, 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 in the most inconvenient of places. You decide you're going you gonna to mess up real good and he shows up right there. You, 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 you gonna dial up a number you, you know you shouldn't have in your phone anymore and all of a sudden you, you dial the wrong number and, it, and you actually call the pastor. I don't know, crazy things where, where when we decide we're gonna mess up real good, Jesus shows up. Here we see where, where now he's on the shore. They're out fishing, they have quit. And he's out on the shore, he's waiting for them, but they did not recognize him. Scripture goes on to say, he called them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. 
And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped uh, his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and, and jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. for They were far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals and there with fish on it, there with, with fish on it and some bread. I always kind of wondered like, like Peter, like why did he, like, you know, like he, he got dressed and, 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 and jumped in the water ahead of everybody else. And then I just started thinking, Jesus has already appeared to them one time before this behind the closed door and he has an encounter with Thomas where he says, put your finger in my hand, put your hand in my side. He tells him, don't, no, now he tells him, you know, stop doubting and believe. But I imagine Peter is thinking, he knows what he said, how he denied and how Jesus even predicted that he would deny him three times. Peter knows this is happening and as he did deny Christ, the Lord looks at him during this horrible ordeal and yet there has been no resolution to that incident. And now Peter has now gotten fed up and offended in his heart again and he knows even though Jesus wasn't there, he knows what he has said in his heart. Have you ever like wanted to rush into a bad situation, kind of like jump on the grenade before it blows up in your face? And here Peter hears, that's the Lord. And when he recognizes it, it's almost like the kid that's in trouble. It's like, let me get dressed. Let me, let me, you know, hear him get there. And, and he almost like, like he wants to get to the shore before the rest of them do just to almost smooth over what really has happened almost to kind of begin to give justification for for like, like what Jesus may think like you know because I'm sure Jesus think, what are y'all doing out there fishing he knows what fishing means to Peter he knows that that's his go-to we all you know we have friends we know our friends go to with if they're stressed we know where we can find them we know when they've had enough where we're gonna find them we know we know what drink they're having we we know what but what they're going to pursue to, to ease their pain or self-medicate. We all know it. Like when we got good close friends, we know where we can find them when they're ready to mess up real good. And Jesus knows what fishing means to Peter. So it goes on. Scripture goes on and says, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Scripture goes on to say, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Now, now you, can, can you all just imagine it? Can you imagine, like, you know, you're eating, no one's saying a word, like no one dared ask who it was. Everybody's eating, everybody's on their best behavior. And you ever been in one of those situations where you're thinking, just don't bring up this. And so you can imagine they're eating about, you know, and I'm at the conversation, oh, and this is the best fish out of this fish, this regular fish, what kind of fish? This this grouper, this is red snapper, you know, this 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 holy catfish, what is this? You know, and, and, and they talk about the bread, you know, oh, this bread is good. What is this? This, this jiffy? Jesus, what you do? Did you use the blue box bread? Like, you know, here's this whole thing where now they 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 you know, everybody's kind of like talking, but they aren't talking because they don't want to talk. And then Jesus like, like breaks the awkward silence. Like, you know, everybody's talking but Jesus. And now he goes, Simon, and, and you, you almost can see him like, oh. <laughs> Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The elephant around the campfire. Don't you hate it when Jesus goes right to the core 
of the mess that we're in. Don't you hate it when there's no tact, no, no fluff, no nothing. He just comes right to your front door, right to you face to face. Simon, do you love me more than these? And I imagine like, I was like more than these, like what, what was the these? And I can only imagine that when he's the these has to be the tools that are around him of all the net and the boat and all the stuff that, that represent Simon, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your old tools of your old life? Do you love me more than your old ways of thinking? Do you love me more than your old ways of getting your own way every time? Do you love me more than these? And I'm telling you for us as a church in times like this, that as we begin now, 30 days in, now we're starting to kind of adapt to a new normal and now maybe picking up some of those things that we have laid down. Now the intensity maybe of our spiritual pursuit of the Lord may be starting to drift a little bit and now he comes right into our living room, right into our prayer time, right into your sleep, right into your dream and says, do you love me more than these? Surrounded by the stuff of your old life, surrounded by your old way of escaping, surrounded by the things that he delivered you. Do you love me more than these? Peter then says, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said then, feed my lambs. Here's now where he gives him a grant. If you love me more than feed my lambs. Why? Wow, first question, if you do, you do you love me more than these? Yeah, you do. Then feed my lambs. What, what's he trying to say? That you cannot care for the most important thing to me, my lambs, my people. If you always have a plan B that you're ready to run to when God doesn't follow your plan. You can't do business for me if you always have another lover on the side from me. He's telling no. Do you love me more than these? Because it's going to take abandoning these in order to go where I have for you to go. And church, here's where we're at. There's some theses that are around us. There's some theses that maybe we've picked up that we are going to have to abandon. Because when we don't understand the leading of God, we cannot go and, and numb ourselves to the, to the hurt of that, to the process of that, just because we don't like the feeling of being uncomfortable. We have got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and fall on the rock who is our comfort, who is the Holy Spirit. Here's where he's telling us, do you love me more than these? You do then. Feed my lambs. Scripture goes on to say again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. Here Jesus tells him, I, I, you cannot take care of the most important thing to me, my sheep, my people, if you always bail out, quit connecting, stop giving, stay offended because you forgot that you're not working for the sheep, you're working for the good shepherd. And I'm telling you church, some of us have got to realize, stop looking for the sheep to give us affirmation. Stop looking for the sheep to say thank you. You have to be about the business of the good shepherd. Some of us have got to find our identity, how to find our security. We have to start feeling good because God says, well done, good and faithful servant, before anybody else does. We have to start to feel good about God knowing what we did when the pastors and the, the other people don't. We got to understand that we can do God's plan before the newspaper or anybody ever posts anything on Facebook, that it's just good enough that God saw it. Sometimes you're just going to have to sing your best song for the audience of one before you ever have an audience of thousands. Sometimes you just got to realize and stop looking for affirmation from the sheep and look for the affirmation that is coming at you daily from the good shepherd. If you're going to feed and take care of my sheep, you have to have love as your motivation because sheep don't act right. The gratification and the gratitude and affirmation that you so badly desire will have to come from the good shepherd, not the sheep. You got to choose who you serve. 
you, you are showing your affirmation, your love for the good shepherd by taking care of the sheep. Do you love me? It's why he asked him that. Bible goes on to say the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? My question here is, did Peter forget how many times he denied Jesus? And, and before you like give a good like, that's right, that's right. Be, be, be careful before you, before you, you put that good neck swing and that all right, be careful. Because that's not the heart of it. Peter, he forgot how many times he denied Jesus. Jesus wasn't saying this to get even with Peter. Jesus was being the redeemer and closing every door of access that Satan would have to Peter's future by bringing up his past of what he did to Jesus, choosing to try and shackle his movements, paralyze him with shame and guilt. Jesus was closing every door that might be open in his future. Jesus, by bringing up some things from our past, is not trying to hurt us, is not trying to check if we were naughty or nice, not trying to make sure that we remember that he's God and we're just little us. There are times where Jesus brings up your past because he's removing obstacles to your destiny. There are times where Jesus is bringing up the past, the things that you're ashamed of, the things that you didn't like, the things that, that you would not even to know. He's bringing them up so that he can remind hell that those things no longer have power over you. We got a lot of time to think about things. And I'll tell you this, our past comes up a lot. The things that we're guilty about, things aren't working out. So we're thinking how this happened, how that kid was conceived, how that relationship started, what I did with money there, how I treated my parents, how I treated my siblings, what I did here and what I did there. And those things start coming at you. But I'm telling you, God brings up your past because he's redeemed you from it. He brings up your past to close every door that the enemy would have to shackle you with shame, to shackle you with guilt, and to paralyze you from being everything and living in the new normal that he's established. So don't get offended when God brings up your past. It's just his new way of guaranteeing your future. Scripture goes on to say that. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Here now, if you look at this, Peter has denied that he even knew Jesus. Peter has been carrying around this guilt. As you know, when Peter ran to the tomb, remember, he was one of the first after the women that ran to the tomb. What was he running for? Carrying the guilt. Now, maybe even thinking, that's why he's in the round. He's still, he's still mad about me, that denying thing. Like, we haven't had a chance to really talk about that. He, he's, he got, Jesus got something with me. I know, I know it. And finally, you know how, like, when, like, when you have an unresolved conflict with someone, and finally, like, when you don't, we can't get it resolved, you find, like, you know what? Before they reject me, I'm rejecting them. Forget them. I, I'm, I quit. I'm going fishing. Where have you gone fishing on God in your life? Where have you gone fishing on a relative? Where have you gone fishing on a situation that you know is unresolved? Where have you, instead of staying in the uncomfortableness of it until Jesus shows up, you've decided I ain't waiting on Jesus to live my life anymore. I'm a, I got to go on. I got things to do. I quit. What I love is the one that quit on Jesus, Jesus never quit on him. And not only did he not quit on him, he entrusts Peter, charges him with the most precious thing to him and God, his sheep. Jesus has just paid an incredible price for sheep, people. And now he has 
charged the very person that denied him with taking care of them, feeding them, looking after them. Come on, that's only the heart of a redeemer. That when you see yourself as a mess up, he sees you as whole and redeemed and worthy of being involved in the kingdom and having purpose that's beyond what you ever thought. When Satan wants to remember your past, Jesus remembers your present and your future and charges you no matter what you have done, no matter who knows what you've done, no matter what you believe about your past, Jesus calls you to fulfill your glorious future in him that he paid a great price for. Finally, verse 19, actually verse 18, he goes on, he tells Peter, metaphorically about how he's going to eventually give his life for the gospel. And then at the tail end of 19, it says, and then he, Jesus, said to him, follow me. Hey, church, look, again, I don't know what's coming in the days ahead, but I hear the Lord saying those very two same words to us, follow me. We are in the midst of where people are making uh, economic decisions, healthcare decisions. Uh, We are being bombarded on every end. And can I just tell you, like, in the midst of all of that, can you just make sure one thing, that you're still following the voice of the Good Shepherd through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Follow me. We started at the beginning of last year saying, you cannot pray your way out of something that you behaved your way into. you got to follow your way out. Church, I'm telling you something. We're going to pray our way through this. We're going to pray our way out of this, but also we got to follow our way out of this. And the way to follow is follow him. Where Jesus is going, I promise you, is where we want to be. There's no alternative route. Follow me. And so again, Last week, I asked you about what are you discussing. Today, I want to ask you, who are you following? Frustrated about your job, who are you following? Frustrated about not having your job, who are you following? Frustrated about the money, who are you following? Frustrated about business, frustrated about being still, frustrated about things being closed, frustrated about things not being open, frustrated about football, basketball, baseball. Who are you following? Do not follow the voice that agrees with what's on the inside of you. Following is hearing the voice that you have chosen that is Lord over your life. Follow that voice. Jesus says, follow me. We have a king. His name is Jesus. And that's who we're to follow. I have no idea what's coming in the days ahead, but here's what I do know that we had better make sure that we're listening to the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit and we are following him. We can't go wrong if we do that. And remember, as you're looking at all of this, remember that Jesus has brought up your past to remove obstacles in your future. When you think about it, even when we have turned, and even when Peter said, I quit, look at what the result of it was. They still had empty nets. Church, hear me. I'm right here with you. There are things I would do that I'd love to escape from kind of the the everyday stress, the everyday life, the everyday living of living in this brings. Trust me, there are things that I think of, but I'm telling you this. Those things will still produce an empty net. It will always overpromise and underdeliver. But even in that, I love how Jesus just asked a simple question. How's that working for you? And can I ask you, how's that working for you? So you're mad. How's that working for you? So you just going to you going to do what you want to do. How's that working for you? Like, let, me just, let, me just, let, let me just come right, right, right where you are. How is that working for you? 
Yeah, because if you're honest, it isn't. And so can I just 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 say, like Jesus said, How, how's that working for y'all? That's, that was Southern Jesus that said y'all. And then after that, he says, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Hey, can I tell you, cast your net on the right side of your life, the Christ side of your life, the God side of your life. And I'm telling you, even in times like this, you will have blessings that you will not have room enough to receive. Scripture, the word of God has not stopped working. It's not shut down. The word of God is not quarantined. His promises are still yes and amen. And we are still called in the middle of all this to follow him. And while during this season, if he's doing some work on our past, it is to make sure that the obstacles toward our future and our destiny are removed because he really is the redeemer of it all. Right where you are today, you just take a couple minutes and can you just think of areas maybe where you said, I quit. Can you think of past things, areas in the past where maybe you're guilty, you've got shame regarding things that you've done, and will you once again come and have a meal with Jesus? Would you come and sit at the fire and, and dare ask him or let him ask you the question? Because here's where he's getting to. He knows, he has confidence, he has absolute confidence in your love for him. He knows that will make the difference. He knows that your love for him will always bring you back. Come on right where you are. Somebody today, let the Holy Spirit just minister to you and remove shame, remove guilt, Remove your unresolved issue with Jesus, with God, and let him bring up the past, not to hold it against you or to make you give an account, but so that he can remove access that the enemy has toward your future to put you in shackles of shame to hold you paralyzed in guilt. Because when it gets down to it, he gave Peter one command that he's given to us, follow me. And you can't follow Jesus if you still want to choose to be in chains. So if you're here today, watching today, joining us today, and. Maybe you just had guilt about church. You've had guilt about all this and you're tuning in, you're watching. And you're kind of thinking like, what is, what is my life going to look like kind of when all of this is over? It can look very different. It starts with making one really important decision. That same thing he said to Peter is the same thing he's saying to you. Follow me. Well, how to do it, Pastor James? First thing is you got to surrender your life to Jesus. Or if you've been distant from God, you got to rededicate your life. You come on home. Don't try and like check off steps. I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Hey, just come as you are. Come right now, right now in your own living room, right where you are. Would you just come to Christ and you say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Father, you said in your word that if I surrender my life to Jesus and believe in my heart, you raise him from dead, I will be saved right now, God. Right where I am, I surrender my life to you. I ask you to forgive me for the wrongs that I've done. I choose to believe that you raised Jesus from the dead. And right now, according to your word, I am saved. I'm your child. And I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that today, would you let us know by either, if you're on one of our online platforms, just just clicking that that says, I raised my hand, like I've, I've received Jesus, or would you email us? Admin, A-D-M-I-N, at theagape.church. Let us know, hey, I made a decision for Jesus, and if you would like to, you can share your address with us. We want to send you how to take your next steps, how to get involved in 
maybe one of our, our online groups so that you can grow in your relationship with the Lord so that you can begin to walk in that destiny where the obstacles have been removed for you. Hey church, we're going to make it. We're going to make it through this. We're going to make it through it following him though. I want to be doing I know it can be very frustrating. I know it is very frustrating. But I'm asking you right now to continue because the word works. Trust him. Follow him. Make sure you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. And follow the way. I love you. I'll see you next week. To think of who you are is Promises you make, they will uphold me. How you hold me, your compassion is never in your mercies on me. Never fail.